It was a monster you. poem you read, and Mike Cowell, as always, was just out of sight, wasn't he? What a great guy, though. I love the Bowery Poetry Club. Oh, yeah. It I was love just it. a New York gem. And I love poets, I think. <laughs> you know, I've got many poetry readings we've been to. And welcome, welcome very much to Conversations. Pleasure to welcome the program, Stephen Hirsch. And he is a poet. He's also um, a, uh, a design, a, 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 an IT person, and we're going to talk about both aspects of that. And it's a great pleasure to welcome to the program, Steve. Welcome very, very Thank much. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks and that network me. and the public access universe of uh, multimedia communication. Um, share with us your background, please. Born and raised, a little bit of that, and then we'll get into a conversation about cabbages and kings <laughs> and IT and so forth. But I'm a New Yorker, through right. and through. Mm -hmm. Born in 1961 right here in Manhattan at New York Sweet. Hospital, mm -hmm. raised in Brooklyn, Sheepshead Bay, mm -hmm. and uh, went to school a variety of places, including uh, Boulder, Colorado at the Naropa Institute and Bard College right up uh, state in Annandale on Hudson, New York. Two very interesting institutions, yeah. I may say. Very yeah. different institutions. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to think that I really got my education at Naropa. Oh, yeah. That's because it's the, a new educational model that breaks boundaries and really integrates the creative arts of the Western disciplines with an Eastern sensibility of contemplative medita yeah. meditation and, yeah. and, uh, and thought. Trumpa Rinpoche was inspirational. Was he there considerably oh, yeah. part of the time? Yeah. And it was... He was uh, the president of Naropa Institute at the time. He was. Now it's Naropa University. And you had Ginsburg. Fully accredited. And you were there and, you're, and with Ginsburg. Alan Ginsburg was a mentor to you well, or Alan, a friend. And Everything in the Alan in Pittsburgh and Ann Waldman co-chair yeah. the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poets. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. Which I spent uh, three years there from 1979 through 81. Did you? Yeah, okay. And I got a certificate in theater from the Europa Institute. Theater. But spent a lot of time working with the poetics. Right. I actually was more interested in poetic performance theatrical performance of poetry. That's where it's at now, I think, in terms of human expression. It was the, the root of all of the, uh, n the rap music of today and right. all of the rap poetics that you're seeing right. so prevalent. It's, uh, it was born in the beat generation. Well, I think so. God bless the beats, right? Oh, they, yeah. they were transitioning between the, what, the Bohemians were before the beats, the beats came, and right. then there came a whole army of what they called hippies, right? And yippies yeah, and so forth. Yeah, but yeah. the beats were the ones that were precursor That's to that, right. don't you think? Yes, yeah? they kind of blazed the trail. They did, indeed. And you and, and Trimpo Rinpoche was, we did a program with him years ago, a Tale of the Tiger. He had a place up right. in Vermont, mm -hmm. and there, the fields were full of people meditating and all that. Mm. He was a great guy. Tale of the Tiger is now called Karma Chilling. Oh, really? It uh, okay. changed its name many years ago. It's still in uh, Vermont? Still in Barnett, Vermont, uh -huh. and a very uh, important center in the Buddhist tradition, yes. I remember we did, we did Wazen Liliantiev and Trumpa Rinpoche mm -hmm. on that swing through Vermont that year, way the hell back in the... 70s and everything. Mm -hmm. It was really good. But he was a beautiful guy, and he he attracted the attention uh, in Buddhism to Alan and also to uh, Bill Burroughs, uh, yeah. William oh, Burroughs, absolutely. and others. Well, Alan was yeah. a student of uh, of Hinduism okay. up until a certain point, uh -huh. and then he um, met Trungpa Rinpoche and some other Buddhist uh, teachers. Right. And, had a very strong affinity with Trungpa Rinpoche, and he became his student. Uh -huh. And then I came to Naropa in 1979 and became Alan's student. That's it. And that's was introduced it. to that type of Buddhism at that point. Right. It's a different kind. Uh, there are different kinds of Buddhism, like there are different sure. kinds of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's worth talking about. And we also don't, we want to get around to mentioning about things in how are things in old Tibet now, because there's uh, a lot of things roiling the world and the international as mm -hmm. it come up to the Olympics and things going on and and the Dalai Lama and that. So understanding Buddhism is something that some people think is really worth paying some attention to. Absolutely. I think a lot of people have misconceptions about what Buddhism really is. Fill us and, in. and they kind of look at the Dalai Lama and maybe some people are buying into this Chinese spin that the Dalai Lama may be behind the violent or, or terrorist actions which Terrorism. Could, couldn't be Buddhism is about as from violent. the truth. Yes, okay. You yeah, know, there's yeah. inherently in the nature of of the Dalai Lama is mm -hmm. is Nonviolence at mm -hmm. its very core, and mm -hmm. it's it's very absurd to have the Chinese government as, uh, accusing the Dalai Lama of inciting violence because it just simply cannot possibly be. I don't think there's been a first time that there's been absurd allegations of certain people being terrorists. I think George the Third called George Washington a terrorist, <laughs> and I know the world at large saw. Uh, um, 
And Mandela, mm -hmm. as a terrorist, called him a terrorist. It's probably not the first time mm -hmm. that that's been done. There's a King fine John line Robin between a social action yeah, and, right. and uh, aggressive, you know, uh, uh, defense of, of your home property land, and then, you know, yeah. suicide bombing is in a whole different different world. I saw somebody that. who said, like, they were talking about suicide bombing in, say, Palestine or something like that. They said their suicide bombing is seen by people on the West Bank sort of like a counterpart to the F-16 that's mm -hmm. on the other side where power resides. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that kind of... Well, it, but it's an interesting issue. But, to get uh, back to the core of the Trump, yeah. Trump is, yeah, right. is Vajrayana Buddhism, which mm -hmm. I think people think of Buddhism as only one type, yeah. but there are many different levels and branches okay. of, of tradition within Buddhist practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that word practice is the key. Mm -hmm. There are philosophical traditions that mm -hmm. are more thought and study oriented, mm -hmm. and then there's traditions that are more practice oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, Chogun Trungpa's form of Tibetan Buddhism, the Vajrayana Buddhism, mm -hmm. is a practice lineage. Mm -hmm. That means there's no way to understand it essentially without engaging to it. Okay. And that practice gives birth to genuine desire to open to the world and experience life on a direct unobstructed basis, mm -hmm. without concepts, mm -hmm. people's uh, you know, tendency to label religious traditions, or to label everything to make it comfortable and easy, yeah. is part of the actual path of the Buddhist practices where labeling is counterproductive to knowledge. Okay. And giving things their identity and rather than letting them be what they are, mm -hmm. and engaging with life and with others mm -hmm. as they are, mm -hmm. rather than what you meaning or, or identity you assign to them right. is a key distinction. Key distinction between that and the Vedic tradition? Is growing out of the Vedic tradition? Was it a heresy? Or, uh, and that? Uh, it's worth well, trying to understand because... Hindu and Vedic traditions uh, are essentially theistic. They're, mm -hmm. they're very devotional and very focused on, on a god. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Buddhist traditions... Oh, gods. Right, gods. Mm -hmm. Buddhist traditions don't you know, necessarily believe or do not believe in the existence of God, mm -hmm. but the, the point of power is mm -hmm. in the present. So the teachings of Buddhism lead you to the present. They lead you to a direct experience of now. And, and be here now, that's Alfred exactly wrote, right. was it Alfred wrote that? Or Ram 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 now. I did a program with Ram Das one time. Oh yeah? Yeah, and he was sitting there, and it was twice I did it, and um, he was sitting, a beautiful guy, mm -hmm. and everything, and he was sitting in what they call the full lotus. Mm -hmm. Did another one with uh, Satchidananda, mm -hmm. Swami Satchidananda. Mm -hmm. That was great. At the St. John the Divine mm -hmm. Cathedral, been there, the biggest cathedral sure. in the world up there. It was beautiful set. Gregorian chants and all that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. He was sitting in the full lotus. Mm -hmm. Where you cross your leg. So I sat in the full lotus, mm -hmm. and I did the hour interview with in the full lotus <laughs> because he was sitting both of those two right. looking I could hardly walk afterward and they were both limber running off and everything right. like that but they were they, they were in that tradition mm -hmm. and it's a it's mm -hmm. a rich tradition one that's really worth thinking about and everything and it's coming to the fore now with the stuff that's going on in Tibet now yeah it's a very powerful uh, global question that that could can't be under emphasized uh, Tibet Deserve, you say underemphasized right, or over? Tibet deserves its freedom. We can't uh -huh. underemphasize this, that, that oh, people who are intending to uh, participate in the viewing of the Summer Olympics, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, in my personal opinion, mm -hmm. I think uh, disrespects the enormous uh, civil rights struggle that the people of Tibet have been, have been going through uh, under the type of treatment that they've been subject to under Chinese rule since 1959. Yeah, I've got a good friend who came out of uh, Tibet with him, with mm -hmm. the Dalai Lama, when it was, I don't know when it was, mm -hmm. and everything, and, and, and that's, a, that's an issue. How do we deal with that in terms of, uh, they, China conquered them, and uh, they, how they claimed it was always part of their rightful they, territory. Well, they would have a claim. So we got uh, how many countries do we have with the UN now? 191 or something like that, I think. Mm. We got 189 sizable communities of 189 of them in New York City, which mm. makes New York great mm. because it's such diversity. But how many, with 5,000 languages, how do we define? Uh, a nation or a group. Uh, we're going to have five. Okay, we have five thousand nations. We just divided up Yugoslavia. Remember, we used to have one country. How do we come to? What is the level at which sovereignty is going to be able to be ascribed to the variegated nation uh, expressions of uh, humanity? And how do we do it? 
uh, conquest has to got that. to be accepted at a certain practical level, no? The Dalai Lama never asked for full sovereignty and independence from China. Uh -huh. uh, you know, they are looking for autonomy on mm -hmm. some very essential levels and to the freedom to practice their, uh, their, their native culture mm -hmm. and to keep the culture alive. Mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about the survival yeah. of an ancient culture that yeah. has brought enormous wealth and art mm -hmm. and yeah. beauty Absolutely. into, into, no doubt about into it. Yeah. Western and Eastern right. cultures. So, right. yeah. Now I think uh, there's no way with the media being as, as pervasive in every corner of the globe right. that any type of injustice such as this can be really brushed under the carpet any longer, it's which, which is, yeah. gr is a great thing. And we have to continue to encourage and foster um, media involvement in uh, bringing this type of thing to light and, and not letting, uh, letting these things get uh, brushed aside in, in lieu of, of a global celebration of athletics such as the Olympics. I mean, we, we need to uh, moderate our, our point of view on our entertainment and our, and our sports athletic uh, uh, profit stream mm. to, uh, you know, not exalt uh, ourselves above this issue. I, I really don't see how anybody can in good conscience participate fully in these Summer Olympic Games, well, either as, a, either as a, an observer, a participant, or as a government uh, kind of participating in it. Um, with these types of, uh, of hor horrible injustices going on in a day-to-day -day basis. It's an injustice that China took over. They, they built that railroad out there. Uh, I'm not going to argue that particular point, but the no. situation as it currently exists remains a hot button mm -hmm. uh, and something that, that we cannot afford to ignore. Okay. Like there's a new book that's coming out. I don't think you're going to let it. Thurman, I think. Robert Thurman, Thurman has, a, has a magnificent scholar, yeah. new book yeah. that's coming out in June called uh, Why the Dalai Lama Matters. Okay, that'd be I was privileged to take a preview look at an okay. advanced release of it. Right. And I think that if anyone has a question yeah. as to what Buddhism uh, serves mm -hmm. and what the philosophy is about and what, what the Dalai Lama is uh -huh. and why he is the Dalai Lama, See they me. should, you know, get that book when it comes out and take a look. And, and uh, Robert Thurman is one of the great Buddhist scholars and teachers Absolutely. in this he, world. He's right here in the city, yeah, yeah, everything. Like, we did a program with him some time back. He's really good. Anyway, but there the, are the questions that come up in terms of that. And, uh, and uh, how are we going to accommodate, inter-accommodate the various ways. Uh, China now, I saw Mr. Hu, Hu Jintao is his mm -hmm. name, and he was giving a talk to the Chinese people, and he's saying, we represent socialism. Marx, Karl Marx, they used to uh, teach Karl Marx in that Western dialectical materialism, and they would eschew any notion of any of the religious traditions because they had a modern day materialistic interpretation of history and so forth mm -hmm. that is their religion, in mm -hmm. a sense. So they're going to impose that on their... Pa they look awfully capitalistic to me. Mm -hmm. So the dialectics of where... How are we going to organize the world, to uh, take the ancient traditions and give validity to the national variegated nature of humanity and so forth? On a religious uh, level? Well, or, 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 but religion in, the, in, the, in the level of reality, like, I don't think, uh, you know, the, 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 the people conquest, have made conquest and changes. I don't think, we're losing American Indian languages and American many, Indian many cultures, cultures and, and native are, cultures being, have been lost, yes. are being super, are being subsumed within a political organization of the United States of America. Absolutely. For and this uh, is some, a politic right, of poetics. Right. This is uh, politics for okay, poets. Okay, talk to it, yeah. That poets are in touch with these these movements. That's right. You're part of a drum group, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Aren't you? Well, that's a native. Yes, I, yeah, right, I right. was one of the founding members of Spirit Hawk. Good, a drum good, circle, good, uh, good, 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 yeah. The rich traditions, yeah. Well, these creative uh, uh, artistic and cultural traditions of painting and, and poets, poetics and, and music, uh, we're losing some of the traction that we may have gained at a certain point in, yeah. our, in our American history by yeah. uh, de-emphasizing this at, at early education levels and schools are struggling to find the funding for music and for, mm. for, for poets. And, yeah. But music is something that, that's never going to be a second string concern for the youth <laughs> of, yeah. of yeah. this country. Yeah, right, right, so right. Thank goodness. Thank to goodness. Pull no funding, poetry, one might say. Yeah. Yeah. Rap yeah. You know, uh, in the inner city yeah. has carried people out of, of their box into a 
larger world. Yeah, and, and poetic, that's yeah. exactly right. And and I'm totally behind the Poetry Slam, yeah. the New Eureka, Me Rose too, Cafe, man. Me Bar too. Bowery Poetry Club. We need more people who are maybe poetically verse or not poets to come mm -hmm. out and experience this because yeah. it's a politic. It's I, a way of getting in touch with current events with life on an essential level. You can't ignore these right. things in your own little uh, limited scope of what you consider to be your your entertainment uh, uh, selections in, in life. You can try, but HBO it's very open. had the great yeah. deaf poetry jam. Yeah, it was right. a great show. It right. brought uh, real poetry to people mm -hmm. you know, uh, who are normally hypnotized by uh, other media mm -hmm. to the exclusion of poetry. Right, 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 right. I know. I had a friend, Richard Rizzi. You probably know him. I know Richard. I knew Paul. He's a poet, and he called me, and he said, I'm going to read it to New Eureka. A real soul so, man. Yeah, real soul man. Yeah. He's great. He's really been there and everything. So I went to the place expecting five or six people sitting around coffee, listening to, uh, you know, something, Emily Dickinson or something, and there were 300 people. Wow. And they were climbing off the walls, and they were coming, and it was alive and well, poetry. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, Lois, she runs the place. Mm -hmm. I talked to her, and she said, it has to do with the slam, where they have these contests. Mm -hmm. And so they judge, and they say, this poll, and they do socially conscious poetry, and, so forth, and they say that's an 8.6, and that's an 8, it's like the Olympics, a and then they have a World Series of poetry. It's really great, it's got a lot of attention, but it's also tied into hip-hop. Because right. hip hop is poetic, particularly a guy right. standing up, uh, just making it up on, this, on the corner and so forth. And on a more pastoral po level, some okay. of the poetry readings I get the most out of mm -hmm. are local, small town poetry readings right. where you've got a handful of local high school students who are sitting in the back in the corners in the dark of the poetry <laughs> reading, <laughs> terrified of getting up and reading the oh, first right. poem, oh, yeah. but who desperately want to be heard yeah. and to break out of that that uh, that shell and, and, yeah, and when show. you see a new poet yeah. get up in front of a formidable audience of writers yeah uh, and yeah. you know shuffle their feet a little bit and show their vulnerability and their yeah, nervousness yeah, yeah. and come out with their core heart uh -huh. as young emerging consciousnesses and yeah. poets in the country it's Isn't it beautiful for me yeah. it's thrilling yeah, yeah 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 then you're really seeing the birth of poetry in America yeah. in their hands yeah you know, they're going to be the people organizing the next wave of poetry mm -hmm. in 10 years. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm totally, uh, I spend time supporting those younger poets. I think yeah. um, writers and poets in this country should, you know, support the, the young poets in their community and who get, was get them on stage and, yeah. and reading. Who was it who said the arts, uh, the artist, uh, the artist poetry is like a part of the arts scene, and it, all, it sort of morphs all over the place, painting and so But who was it said the artist is the antenna of the race? Was it Pond, I think? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if it was Pond. Somebody said, they're the antenna of the race. They pick up things earlier from the zeitgeist to the mm -hmm. spirit of the age or two than in general frequencies. They got a lot of different up information from more sources internally and externally. Yeah, but there's there, they're like it was... Um, Cubism presaged a lot of what was going on in physics and so forth, and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that kind of so they're really important, and they're not given enough. Uh, science and creativity always grow hand in hand. The science and science and creativity. Well, wait a minute. Science has an aspect to it that is creative. Mm -hmm. I don't. You put uh, C. P. Snow said the uh, you know the two cultures art and, and when I science. say science, I'm yeah. thinking more empiricism. Mm -hmm. Really, the yeah. willingness yeah. to engage with life and with the world on its real specific level. Allen Ginsberg yeah. used to teach He's very much teach. an objectivist, imagist approach to poetry. Mm. Uh, William Carlos Williams, yeah. Charles mm. Reznikoff, mm. where the poem is the thing. Mm. Things speak for themselves sufficiently. You don't need to embellish the object. Uh -huh. So in order for that to really come to life, there mm. needs to be an extraordinary level of attention paid to the moment, to the mm. object. To the moment, Not yeah. to your own internal emotional churning or thinking process necessarily uh -huh. of trying to be poetic or trying to be a, be a poet identity mm. in the world. Yeah. That follows naturally. Yeah. You know, Alan's greatest gift, I think, to me and mm. to his students was vision, yeah. seeing life on its own terms clearly mm. and letting it be what it is and <clears throat> filling up yourself with a full sense and a full uh, kind of a holographic breath. Mm -hmm. You know, Alan was very much into the mind breath where yeah. you can fill your mind and your heart with the fullness of it and then let that naturally come out mm -hmm. instead of 
trying to wrestle language into shape in mm -hmm. order to make it fit a preconceived notion. Right. So that's why Alan's work was so groundbreaking and why yeah. his, his, uh, his initial reading of Howell mm. really rocked the world so intensively. What year did you do that? He was up at Columbia. I think when it was 1966. No. 66. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was it 66? I know it was Yeah, 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 yeah. He was there. Yeah, but well, was, I'm, I may be wrong. He was something else. Days. He was really great and everything. And then there was something going, and there was all these kind of things led by the arts. And then we had the beatniks. We're back to the beatniks. And then we had this whole influx of things that happened and culminated in the Woodstock Festival in 1969. Mm -hmm. And there was something blowing in the wind. Bobby Dylan came along, great poet, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Well, the, and the folk mu music movement of the 60s, Joni Seager, Mitchell, Joni Mitchell, Seager, yeah. uh, Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. they were, in a sense, the real poets of their generation. <laughs> just happened to be proficient in musical instruments, yeah. and they merged them together in a way that, that again, poetry, that was the last time poetry really uh, initiated a cultural revolution, mm -hmm. along, along with, of course, uh, you know, uh, psychedelic drugs and, and marijuana and other, uh, you know, anti-war sensibilities where we were no longer going to adopt the belief systems and the philosophies of our, of our parents, and everyone was trying to feed us what they thought life was and what was real and not real. I think we've so, always... So, uh, the Beats really said, Listen to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, don't don't buy anyone else's uh, pattern for for your life. You know, yeah. break free, uh, break the mold, and 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 do something do something new and something real. And they were precursor to the hippies, which emerged. I think they in were great numbers. Uh, you know, from various mm -hmm. places. And something was happening along about 1970. That way, it was happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. There was something uh, in the air as it were going on and everything. Definitely a paradigm shift. A from paradigm the shift, right? From well, there's always been that thing about the younger generation thinking the old fog fogies are getting in the way and that kind of stuff. But this was in space. There was something really important going on, and yet people will look back to that and they will say it was just about licentious. It was all sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and people throwing, kicking off the jams, no responsibility. To that tried to downplay that, along with also getting over, let's say geopolitically, the Vietnam syndrome, that we had a Vietnam war that was mm -hmm. going to have to end up with our saying we lost the war, mm -hmm. and we misjudged and killed four million people, which mm -hmm. gets, uh, carries a lot of karma with it, and we still haven't faced up to that, and no one has gone in the dock for the killing of Southeast Asian people in such mm -hmm. high numbers mm -hmm. that was at on our watch, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as we learned from the Carlos Castaneda uh, yeah. legacy and Don, you know, the Don Juan legacy and yeah. Carlos's work, uh, the early books, especially that you had accept a lot of use of psychedelic uh, substances. Mm. Um, I like to kind of equate that to the larger psychedelic movement of the '60s. Is that it was a tool that mm. was used to unlock certain understandings and sensibilities of consciousness when it was used as at its best. Unfortunately. Uh, the, the larger cultural and individual ego took control of that and turned it into the kicks of the, of the 70s and 80s. Yeah, irresponsibility. Which, which, which degraded the, yeah. the power of that experience, and those that did use it successfully were changed irrevocably. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Well, perhaps so. I did put on Timothy Leary one time we talked about that, and he was really, uh, you know, he and Alpert and that, and he, he said he thought that the uh, psychedelics were just like, say, the very thin layer of frosting in terms of what was going on in terms of an evolution of consciousness and that the big story was technology and the extension of capability in terms of our t extending technological capability, feedback mechanisms from that kind of thing, Marshall McLuhan tract and mm -hmm. that kind of mm -hmm. thing, and that that was really what was causing a transformation and it may be that it was bringing about a transformation, qualitative paradigm shift, as you say, that still goes unnoticed or unconcerned by people who are in positions of responsibility geopolitically and in a business sense mm -hmm. for the operations of the interrelated spaceship Earth. Don't you think we still have a problem with the vision thing at inadequate to what the future either requires or allows in a liberating new way? We're still looking for vision, or what do you think on that? Well, as a poet, I can say that the poet lives by vision. Mm. Uh, you know, a poet's unique because of their personal vision. Mm. Uh, any creative person, mm. you know, they're, they're marked by their vision. Uh, any successful person is uh, marked by the, the clarity and the power of their ability to express and articulate Hitler their vision. Hitler was successful up until about 1940. I think so. You know, the, the, woke up the visionary yeah. aspect mm -hmm. of many sleeping 
minds in this world. Okay. And so that we, we were able to uh, kind of break the mold of what we thought life was supposed to be patterned as, and mm -hmm. that pattern suddenly uh, broke into a, th a million shards, mm -hmm. and we had to pick up the pieces and mm -hmm. reestablish identity in a new world. Well, and okay. we're, we are dealing with a very powerful challenge as creative people in the world mm -hmm. today, trying to maintain a sense of purity of our intention and our vision, mm -hmm. and also cope with survival issues and, and falling home prices and, and the difficulty in, uh, in making ends meet and all of the things that, that concern everybody. So because they you have to be, live in the world, be of the world, uh -huh. and learn how to manage the in, incredible challenge of, uh, of those, those, that balance. Uh, uh, yeah, being yeah. creative in a world that doesn't necessarily want to support the, the creative process. All well, there are people who associate the creative process with the criminal class. <laughs> because the criminal class are outside the fishbowl of the paradigm accepted. Like when Galileo said we didn't go around the you know, the sun went around us, everybody had their identity wrapped up in that, and it, it was terribly disrupting of the means by which people get a sense of identity. Mm -hmm. We still have not been able to, from visionaries or from whoever it is that's going to bring some understanding of what's going on at a very high comprehensive level, mm -hmm. come up with a pattern that is really relevant to what the future either requires for our mm -hmm. survival mm -hmm. in an age of species lethal weapons systems that can outlaw, can wipe out humanity within a half an hour, perhaps as Ted Turner said the other day, mm -hmm. or perhaps on the other reverse side of that, a liberating potential from what James Joyce called history, and he called it the uh, history of the nightmare from which I'm attempting to awaken, and we're still in that razor's edge, which means the vision thing has not been able to adequately inform the political and business leadership of this planet who uh, do most of the setting of the template by which all the institutions are established. Well, you're right in that we really almost know too much at this mm -hmm. point. We and think. Technology is a double-edged sword, as mm -hmm. we know, but uh, as we both previously discussed, uh, you know, relative to the work of author Ray Kurzweil, yeah, he's great. Right, we think, we yeah. are in a, a very uh, potent potent point in our human history, mm -hmm. and in uh, especially the evolutionary history of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, in this particular period, we're um, able to benefit in an extraordinarily profound way from advancing technology on right. a creative and a psych psychological and emotional level. Uh, it, technology and science can give us more free time, more leisure, improve our lives in, in infinite ways, um, but it also, obviously, we have the capability to destroy the planet's biosphere well, we'll hundred, say, wait a times over. Well, uh, that's something as recently, uh, I was born in 35, mm. so it certainly uh, encompasses my lifespan, mm. but in terms of the Second World War, where we really were full tilt boogie trying to kill each other as best as we possibly mm. could. With the Nazi and the Axis and the EU, and uh, we were impotent to do anything like species lethal damage to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Something has changed qualitatively new mm -hmm. in that time frame, mm -hmm. and it seems never to be given much attention. I was happy Mr. Turner brought it up in his very good interview with Charlie Rose the other day. It's issue number one. I think most uh, rational, intelligent people in this world realize the absurdity of a uh, nuclear arms race at any level. Not only nuclear, other things too, biological, uh, sure, uh, any germ, weapon of mass destruction. And they've got uh, what, uh, space stuff uh, that is ju just ahead of the curve. Because all the research has been led by weapons technology has been the leading thing of which is supported by the military-industrial complex that mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Eisenhower warned us against, isn't it? Still is. Regrettably, much technology has been initiated and they still by have no vision, military initiatives. Yeah. And they still have no vision of a liberated humanity from something like the change, the bound of some of our Marxist brothers would say we're all a bunch of wage slaves and a case could be made for that. We don't have a system that's relevant to what the future requires. Because we don't trust ourselves as human beings. Well, for whatever reason, we don't. And if it's going to come, it might come from the poets more than it will come from the people who are ensconced within the paradigm that's right. That's right. that we're transcending, perhaps. Maybe we're coming to a point of speciation or qualitative transformation, the evolution of universal consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's a singularity of a certain kind that we can now destroy the whole species. Unfortunately. Couldn't do it out. 200,000 years we've been there. It might be worth contemplating once in a while through the models or something. Well, that that's something worth considering once in a while and maybe more importantly considering on the adverse side of that yin-yang, mm -hmm. 
Well, it's right there may be out. a liberation that's blowing in the wind. There is. And our systems that will not allow us to get to that mm -hmm. because they're outdated. And so the poets may be the source of the vision that could be on the liberating side mm -hmm. of that particular mm -hmm. equation, perhaps. Since the birth of the Industrial Revolution, we've been on a fast track to a point of no return, like Ray Kurzweil had said, a point of singularity, where we uh, just know uh, uh, we reach a point with science, with nanotechnology and mm. nuclear medicine, and uh, where our lifespans can be so greatly increased. Might be able to just uh, overcome eventually, the mortality really, itself. Yeah. I think the, one of the, Maybe. you know, in terms of a science fiction, mm. things that are science fiction today that yeah. we cannot believe could be real, right. you know, are going to be real a yeah. hundred years from now, yeah. the same way that our great-great-grandparents would never have believed that we could fly in the sky. Yeah, right. the yeah. so, of course we're going to fly up the yeah. Yeah, yeah, like have another bird. drink. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think uh, we have to let go of any preconceived notion or concept of what's mm -hmm. possible and impossible, mm -hmm. and kind of take as as a kind of a given axiom that if we uh, anything that we consider really impossible by our very naming of it mm -hmm. as impossible no. is now possible. Back to Buddhism. Maybe. That yeah. we are given yeah. the antidote by mm -hmm. creating the problem. Mm -hmm. The antidote is self self yeah. existent mm -hmm. in that question. Mm -hmm. So we are going to grow technologically and in terms of science to the point where we will be able to clone human beings. Yeah, that's a big We will be able to eliminate biological the diseases uh, that are ending genetic. our lives by our 80s and 90s now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But what would happen, let's say, if a great scientist such as Edison or, yeah. or uh, uh, Madame Curie, uh, uh, in their time, if their lifespans were two and three times as long, yeah. we would be have these great minds discovering extraordinary things that yeah. their shorter lifespan has prevented them from, from think, discovering. Yeah. So as we yeah. have longer lifespans, yeah. our greatest thinkers and our scientists mm -hmm. are going to discover more and more unbelievably ground-shaking technologies that will revolutionize life on the planet. Yeah, and it might also be coming out of the people more than it has because, uh, you know, there's 100, tr 100 trillion cells in the human organism, they all matter. Every cell matters. And here we, we've got uh, the two-thirds of our population of the world just wondering how the hell they're going to eat, <laughs> as lo and much less being able to realize the potential. Right. So there's a great deal of space for allowing the full renaissance and fulfilling of the human capability in a collective scale for everybody, because we right. don't have systems that can, they only serve the upper 20% or so, and all political entities across the country mm -hmm. are able to live something like what might be called the life of the mind and the spirit. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we got a long way to go in that kind of thing, and it's a little bit upsetting. You, we're going to veer off, and we're going to write you to read a piece of your monster poem. Oh, you read okay. like read poem? Well, well, let's hold just for a second okay. and just go into a little bit, because you've got another in incarnation, as it were, in something, as an IT professional. That's right. And you've got some reporting to do from that front. You do pre-publication... Uh, technology and so forth. I'm a, Talk a, a little a bit about that. I'm a technologist in the magazine and book publishing field. Important field. That's yeah. my professional career. Yeah. I, I uh, am a workflow designer and a weekend programmer, so to speak, of database systems and uh, p procedural workflow systems for publishing magazines via computers, you, Macintosh computers specifically, yeah. mostly. But you handle my APC also. Oh, absolutely. And you're familiar with CAD CAM in the world of engineering. Computer-assisted design, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And all of these kind of things that are coming, Ray Kurzweil is of interest to you because he understands those things well. Well, you right? look at media today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, newspapers media and media. magazines are falling uh, uh, kind of to the wayside as, as premier media delivery systems mm -hmm. where most users, if you look at the new Amazon Kindle, that amazing little handheld book reader mm -hmm. that uh, gives you I haven't you a, even heard of it It's a, a book reader. You can download books wirelessly mm -hmm. and then, you know, read them. It's a very green device. I think the movement of media toward green technologies yeah. uh, that That's use it. less paper is great. But, you know, people like to the, the tactile feel of holding magazines. Oh, right. There are many niche magazines that are going to continue to be published for many years right. to come. But if you take a look at it, you know, the magazine industry and the newspaper industry is under severe duress. Yeah. And, That's what you uh, tell me. That's yeah. what I I'm mediating for publishers now uh, on the front lines, helping them to revamp workflows, uh, increase efficiencies, uh, implement autom automations of various types mm -hmm. on the editorial and the, the image level for digital mm -hmm. images, yeah. and, uh, delivery systems mm -hmm. for magazine content through yeah. the internet mm -hmm. uh, to handheld devices and PDAs. This is all... Uh, What's a PDA? Uh, personal digital assistance. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's a device? Yeah, it's like okay. a Palm Pilot. Uh, oh, yeah, right. Is a PDA phone. Mm -hmm. 
Right. The iPhone is like a PDA in phone. Yeah. Yeah, we're involved in that. No, wait, we're in cable television here, and then it's also mm -hmm. now we're linked into the computer. you got the YouTube. You can archive programs that People way. People watching YouTube on their iPhones. That's going to morph to the cell phone industry, and i got a friend who does it from their laptop. They mm -hmm. can stream, which means essentially they're setting up a television channel in the telecosm, mm -hmm. and you're going to morph that over into the cell phone, well, and you're going to end up digital with six paper. You know, mm -hmm. very thin paper type uh, screens mm -hmm. that are uh, computer screens that okay. are wirelessly connected to, to content sources. Yeah. Where instead of, you know, wasting hundreds and thousands of trees in printing, if you can press a button to scroll page by page through the morning newspaper mm -hmm. uh, and read it on a device that could be rolled up and put into your pocket, it seems like a, a, a paradigm shift is fast approaching yeah. for for the publishing world. And it's not only print, although you're talking about magazines where that's a layout thing, and it's an art, I mean, to laying oh, yeah. it out. And there's a lot of pre-publication things that can Digital be done. retouching, working with images in Adobe Photoshop, which right. is the premier tool for, for retouching computer okay. images. Big industry. Yeah. The Huge. publishing industry and the level, I don't know if that most into uh, book publishing, yes. uh, or, or also newspapers, magazines, magazines and everything. It's a big industry and a lot of it gets to be very much of an art. And oh, you publish a, a poetry magazine, I know yes, yourself, I yes, where I you can bring all your skills to that, but you're also working within the industry and understand pretty much what's going on mm -hmm. at that level of automation mm -hmm. and manipulation of these images. Don't forget these image, these text things are also, with graphics, are also morphing over into multimedia television. Sure, publishers is, are looking for expanded <laughs> profit streams from multimedia and internet-based content delivery. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of ways, uh, many magazines now sell a digital uh, version of the magazine, a Zinio version, as they say, which is downloadable off the internet. That's a PDF file, you which most people file. are familiar with it. They yeah. double-click on it, and then they click the corner of the page on the screen, and the actual animation of the page turning yeah, right. you know, occurs, and you, you see the next page. Couldn't they have a little whoosh that makes it sound like the page Sound effects turns are all really part of it. Yeah, sure. and they could get something in there, and you could project it on a wall or something like that. Yeah. Uh, the planetariums of the world are the largest visual display screens, mm -hmm. and they've got, they got stuff to where they can increase that to a degree. Mm -hmm. the it makes I'm, it makes a, a IMAX look like a, a Cineplex. It's never been more true no. to say that what the mind can conceive, man can achieve. That's right. So we're, our imaginations are being invited to completely run wild when it comes to uh, the new media paradigm. Uh -huh. Because uh, there's nothing that, it, that we won't be able to accomplish and communicate and share mm -hmm. uh, eventually. It's yeah. all going to reach a very high level with uh, as web and internet technologies advanced uh, mm -hmm. in the new web 2.0 model and mm -hmm. other uh, intelligent means of programming uh, mm -hmm. uh, digital delivery and content. What do we uh, get, when, what about the possibility that the technology is going to be beyond let's say the political problems of outsourcing where you go from a high, uh, you, you go you know from the United States and you take care, advantage of cheap labor in other parts of the world mm -hmm. where kids are locked up yep. to their U loom or something it's and they can right now in the but, publishing but, uh, that that is one level but at the other level Lord Keynes John Maynard Keynes mm -hmm. wrote a letter to his grandchildren saying you are going to be confronted it'll be about now mm -hmm. his say, his grandchildren you're going to be confronted with technological unemployment <laughs> that there is going to be a capability of turning out a cornucopia but it's not going to require jobs or human input to the process. Sarah Lee, I think I they make all that. Okay, you tend to. I tend to disagree you because think while certain, jobs certain employment people? models will necessarily pass away. Certain types of jobs, as traditional art director's roles and traditional processes for composing final camera-ready magazine content, which used to use a waxer and burnishers and various types of manual My granddad now it's all being composed on the screen and yeah. being delivered in a final PDF. I know. So everything that's is being good. streamlined. I that's think that's, that's a very good thing. My yeah. granddaddy was a union organizer of lithographers at the turn of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. There'll but be new technologies that will give birth to new jobs, but more and more young. Wait Wait a minute, that's the model. In, the, in, the, in stu school today have okay. to learn mm -hmm. these new models and be ready. And most uh, most universities and most uh, educational programs for publishing today do have a very very strong now digital, you're taking a digital take on, aspect. I see you're taking a look at it in terms of the industry you're involved in and so mm -hmm. forth. But Mr. Kane said that it is going to, he wasn't talking about a particular industry, he was talking about a paradigm, mm. and that you're going to have displacement of human input 
to the productive process and that you're going to be able to have automated systems. Marshall McLuhan once said they're going to be able to produce not only, and also variety, and it's a thing where they can produce as many different colored automobiles as black, as Mr. Ford used to do, at no added cost, and that these automated things, and you do not need people to be doing things which on the assembly line in my Detroit where I was growing, you had to turn in that eight hours a day and somebody's doing things. You're going to be able to give people leisure mm -hmm. rather than having to go out and do something yeah. that they are going, and that's the only way we have legitimately, at least as we think of it, for the vast majority of people to get any income or dollar bills into their pockets that's what's is for them to have a job doing something, inputting their labor to a productive process that is increasingly the result of capital instruments We're and still technology. speaking too limitedly, however. Right, we don't have a model that that's is right. allowing the possibility that people may be leisured and also affluently leisure, mm -hmm. as opposed to being, let's say, unemployed and you've got the Great Depression in 1929. Well, robotics and artificial intelligence yeah. are going to lead the way forward for, uh, for the future, and it's not, uh, there's not any question in my mind that it's coming. It's just a matter of how quickly. Um, I do not believe. I heard you say earlier, people, leisure is people, leisure a people, bad thing. It's not. In it's fact, not. If you're, if you're, technology if you're affluent, is going to give us more leisure, more affluent time. leisure. Are we going to have a system where people can be affluently leisure? Yeah. Yeah. Stop thinking too limitedly about affluence. Okay. With, okay. About okay. money. Uh -huh. There needs to be a well, revolution have that in, very much in the home. value system mm -hmm. of what it is that we're at, of the currency in a sense of what mm -hmm. we're talking about. Mm -hmm. If we look at it from our our current limited context, mm -hmm. yes. Expanded technology is going to eliminate current m job models, mm -hmm. but it's going to create new opportunities, and there's going to be new growth. Well, that's the and, uh, and instead of us uh, being trained to perform these manual techniques and processes in our educational system, we're going to be trained and become prepared and ready for the new paradigm of, of opportunities for employment. Well, that's what it has been because the the the, the, uh, the model that they have to keep it would be like the elliptical pathways of pre Copernican you know, understanding of the way the universe is set up and so forth. The model that has to be is we're going to distribute income, not from the people who own the technology, the cotton-picking machine that's building it. Mm -hmm. That's all owned by a tiny group of people called plutocrats. They set the template for all the institutions, and everyone else is going to have a job that's going to be set by those few people who own it, and it's going to be turning out all this wealth, and they're going to try and validate the human input to that productive process, like we'll put the field hands out there picking the cotton, when the cotton machine's really doing the work, and they're not going to relate them to the way things are actually being produced, and we'll do jobs. In, 19, in the turn of the 1920th century, the biggest uh, job role was the individual farm. Mm -hmm. Then came combines mm -hmm. and these kind of things. We now produce with 2% of our population food that could feed the world. Mm -hmm with machines, and they all had to go into factories, and that model still holds. We're going to create wealth. We're going to, no, we're going to create jobs. Uh -huh. An opportunity for people to get income from what they do is the way we do it. I think one of the things that... And that I, you don't think there's a problem There's that. not, because... And that it's all... You owned. have to look at the technology itself. Okay. Look at the way Ray Kurzweil would uh, kind of describe nanotechnology. Yeah. We're talking about the, co the composing of material <laughs> objects at the molecular level. I know. So... We're we're talking about Not what would require components of manufacturing <coughs> to combine to make manufacture an object. Mm -hmm. We're eliminating or transforming the entire model of our understanding of the natural universe and how we interact. Yeah, with. that's a singularity. If we are able to computer. develop technology, mm -hmm. we are like the Star Trek notion of replicator, mm -hmm. i.e., we develop nanobots of various mm. qualities They're coming now. that are constructing on a molecular level anything right. that we program them to create. 20 the times raw uh, yep. atomic materials. That's right. The actual elements That's on the right. periodic table. That's right. We, are, we, That's right. we have to think at that level that yeah. we have, the, we're growing no the power yeah. of being able to have, in a sense, Affluence. God-like power in yeah. the natural world. Right. We're, we're becoming God-like. Mm -hmm. uh, on some sense, not, uh, I wouldn't equate us as, as having that internal awareness of, mm -hmm. of 
to of a totality unless we're, you know, we're not super beings, but we're getting a scientific understanding of, of how uh, uh, material things mm -hmm. are put together mm -hmm. and what holds them together. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we're going to be able to create things mm -hmm. from the molecules of the natural world I know. through an a sense, a kind of uh, alchemy. I I you know, turning things and uh, turning, turning elements into things. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but it's a brilliant, and, and it, it is carbon sixty is coming. The whole IT industry is going to be beyond the silicon chip. It's going to be within mm -hmm. what they call uh, carbon sixty. Well, DNA but based Mr. Fullerene. No, that's what carbon sixty is a. They're going to have a computing element that's going to go through the bloodstream. That's right. And it's going to be ever more efficient. Physical computing. And yeah. it's increasing exponentially. Mm -hmm. It's increasing. So we're coming to a time maybe transcending material scarcity as an ontologic reality. That would be a big I like the term so transhumanism. 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 Okay, okay. Transhumanism Go there. Sense Go there. is uh, the next step of evolution for the human human being. Speciation? Well, it's more a, a diversification and a variegation. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we, ha if you look at people downtown mm -hmm. on any Friday night. New York or in New, New York? York? Any major urban city. Maybe different. You've got or, yeah. an enormous assortment of characters and people with, with piercings and tattoos and hairstyles and clothes. Particularly Everybody in New York. York. To, to yeah. vary themselves be unique yeah. individual Sam can you imagine mm. if an individual could go into a medical center and say I really, really want to grow fur all <laughs> over my body. I like the way it feels. My lover wants it that way. Mm. Can you give me a, a coat of fur like a cat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'll be able to modify your genetic coat to do that. Or I want to grow wings. Mm. Or can I strengthen yeah. my eyesight? I mean, they yeah. already have implants yeah. and mm. various technologies yeah. Instantiation. For giving blind yeah. people the ability to see. Yes, they do. And they for do. It's increasing our senses. Mm. Technology will ma merge with our bodies. To yeah. Yeah. enhance our senses. So let's to give us the ability to hear and see and smell and taste and be in a state of, of experience that is far beyond what we can currently conceive. Suppose we can try and encompass all that in some sort of a thing like a singularity. A singu We've had a series of singularities. Well, that's what we're really talking about. Well, is maybe. I think so. A is singularity is near. We know how to use our natural world in that way, and then there's no turning back from it. Well, that. a singularity is a qualitative transformation. The Big Bang was a singularity. If that holds up, that began this year particular universe. It may, be tra you know, may have all multi-universes and so forth, but you have a singularity. The appearance of life was a singularity in this particular planet so many billion years ago, and then the appearance of Homo sapiens self-reflective consciousness was a singularity 200,000 years ago, mm -hmm. and we may be coming to the end of that. There's a period, we're coming to the end where we get to the, this is not your normal time, we've got the ability to destroy it all in an eye blink, and we may have the ability to transcend the condition in which all of our evolutionary con we've been gestating. And if there's, years. if there's one percent chance mm -hmm. that we're not going to destroy this planet, every, for that. every conscious person has got to hold fast to that and go for that right. and work toward our, our collective salvation. But, but let me not tell you, it's not going to be God that saves us. Well, no, but it's it going to be science and technology that saves us on this planet. Well, that's within the context in which we're seeing things, but if uh, it, it's probably an a priori mysterious quality, or the, the, the structure of universal mind is probably, uh, it, it would seem, it'll be a priori mysterious. And it, it, if we liberate, let's just use the term loosely, Aristotle said that may be ahead, or they've been looking for that. If we get it to where everybody is, it's like a music metaphor. Everybody is realizing their full potentiality rather than being so constricted now mm -hmm. by the institutions we've inherited out of a certain condition mm -hmm. that has been transformed, and that you have a liberation of the whole human society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everybody's able to realize their full potential. There would be a synergistic resonancy, like an orchestra, mm -hmm. that would inter-accommodate us to universe, perhaps, at a level transcendent to what we've been throughout 200,000 human uh, well, they, existence. In many and traditions. we may be, in a sense, speciating or coming into a new relationship to That's universal right. consciousness. Absolutely. And many or traditions the identify mm -hmm. the, quote, 144,000 awakened beings. What's that mean? It's a critical mass. 
class that apparently has shown up as a value within many ancient Hindu and, and oh, Mayan cultures and other other uh, it's also uh, scenarios where uh, we're reaching. We need to reach a critical mass of conscious people. It's a magic number. And that 144,000 awakened warriors or awakened beings are going to uh, lead the way and and show uh, everyone how it is we're well, going to save our planet and yeah. and live in I rather, harmony with one another. Well, I rather like more. 144 is also the evangelical notion of how many are going to get into heaven when everybody else is burned to death. There's that kind of thing. It's got a thing. 100. But I'm a rather more like the Bodhisattva notion comes out of it. They, they in, enlightened. Let's say they're enlightened and everything. And then rather than racing through the gate, I notice there's a lot of people want to race through the gate first. first. Uh, but they come back and they're coming back and then they make sure that the collective whole That's right. is going through, and then they go last. But there aren't many of those people Racing around. through the gate is, a, is yeah, maybe but a sense that there's, seems to be trying to get through that, that there's gate a goal first. to get to. And, and or ego. You know, in a sense, and Buddhism is about letting go of, of fruition, letting yeah. go of the goal, yeah. and being with the process. In okay. fact, one of the great mottos of Naropa Institute was no. the question Mm. is the answer. The answer, right, yeah. Well, so live fully in the question. No, but the and question... And let it, let it live, uh, give it its space, it, and the answer will arrive. But the larger question around this idea of singularity, are we at a time of qualitative transformation in terms of our relationship and understanding of the evolution of consciousness? Are we speciating? Stephen Jay Gould and Eldridge and so forth would say that you have a quantitative transformation and then there is punctuated equilibrium. There, there will be a moment when we will be other than what we've been mm -hmm. as a human species. I tell you, I agree with you. And we're you. coming to, an, you say transhuman, mm -hmm. but it would be a collective, it would be the collective realization of a liberation of all the cells of what would be the human organism, of the model of a human individual, you would be a hundred trillion cells, they all matter, it would be a liber but we can't just have a few people running through the gate and that they're going to be liberated. And I so agree with you because it's, it's getting more and more painful to live on this planet. Right. So and, in a sense right. the, the, the and we'll blow it up if we don't get a vision that's going to be liberating and just in a certain sense in terms of the whole of the human and that well, has to be get a vision. I'm saying that, that each that individual must acknowledge and exalt their own personal vision. Yeah, right, and right. not adopt uh, a cultural or social paradigm that flies right in the face of who they are at their very core. Yeah. That a lot of people are willing to buy what they're taught and yeah. swallow what they're given. Oh yeah, they and, can be. And this is part of the problem. Yeah. Is what poets do and any mm -hmm. creative person say, I'm not going to swallow mm -hmm. what they're feeding me. Uh -huh. I'm going to make a personal statement mm -hmm. that, that does that flies in the face of, of common accepted mm -hmm. models. And yeah. the more people that as individuals do that, then as a as a unified culture we will by that very fact be mm -hmm. evolving to the point of gut speciation. Well that would be speciation and we can't if you're in the womb, if you're an entity within the womb, you can't know what it's like outside that womb. Mm -hmm. We make projections about the nature of the universe and all kinds we've made throughout all these spiritual traditions, right. but we don't really know because we've never experienced it, and it, there is That's no right. guarantee we're gonna make it. We are liable for we the are complete right, lack of evidence. We are we and there's no guarantee that we can make it. It's synergetic. It's the behavior systems unpredicted by the sum of the past. Mm. It may be in terms of the larger universe we're meant to entropy mm -hmm. or just do well, ourselves in and probably other civilizations We have to learn have. how to find some pleasure in living in the mystery. Uh, well, living with mystery particularly at another level because it's nested. Mm. I don't suppose we have, we had Australopithecine and all the hominoid line and they didn't have anything like the consciousness that happened apparently 200,000 years ago, 10,000 well, generations. We think that we're human. Well, we, and we that's, that's really just an idea that we have. You think so, yeah? Yeah, I don't think we really know who or what we are. Well, if you take the criteria, it depends on your criteria. If your criteria of the purpose of the universe is to hit a little white ball really well into a cup, the Tiger Woods is number one. <laughs> or if it's to be you are very fast at moving, it would be like a gazelle mm. more than a human being. But if you take the criteria as having something to do with this mystery of consciousness mm -hmm. or of understanding or taking the measure of things, mm -hmm. it seems to me a case can be made for the the United States, uh, the humanity being sort of on the leading edge of that look element the of development. Look at the example of the Buddha. Mm. You know, 
one individual mm. can blaze the trail in a, in a completely new paradigm for the entire species. So well, and yeah. as individuals, if we fulfill ourselves at our core DNA level, mm -hmm. if we fulfill our genetic code, and, That's we, right. and we become fully who we are, and we execute that at, with, uh, with uh, pure passion, then we are fulfilling our purpose on the planet. Right. You know, we don't have to take responsibility well, we for everyone reaching you the gate at the same time, th but in a oh. sense we have to be willing to let go of the goal. Why not? Why not? Why not? You think there's such a thing in a meaningful sense as individual liberation? You can be no, liberated it's on a day by day. unliberated. If you're standing at the gates of Auschwitz watching people go into the oven, but you've got everything you want and you're happy, can you be liberated? No, no, and of such, course. So it has compassion a, thing, is, a, compassion a compassion is and a collective sense ethic. of your part of the whole. Every cell in an organism is important. Did you know but that? we don't have to second guess ourselves and think about what everyone else is doing before we be genuine. No, but realize it. And be an individual in the world that's growing in his own unique way. I think maybe It's our variegation and mm -hmm. our uniqueness that makes human life the potent and extraordinary experience that it is. The wondrous experience. That's right. It really if is we're great. all, you know, homogenous the way, uh, you know, if from, uh, you know, a, co a communist point of view yeah. uh, at a central uh, a a human personal level, mm. if we're all uh, punched out of a cookie cutter, yeah. we're, we are not going to grow. Mm -hmm. We're going to... Um, Basically, degenerate in 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 many uh, many ways that uh, that no one who's a conscious creative person wants to see happen. I mean, and it's a, at the mm. essential nature of the human being to reject and rebel against that. Uh -huh. And this is a rebel against political that. political yeah. unrest. Yeah. Is that you can't have religious systems and political systems tell human beings who they are and what they're going to experience. There's a lot of people trying to do that. Don't don't you? Absolutely. I think the United States of America is trying to do that. constricted and miserable lives, uh -huh. trying to fit the mold mm -hmm. of what their their parents, their society, their schools, their teachers, their, their priests, their, their rabbis, all are telling them that they have to live. Mm. There's an essential natural ethic that all, you, all creatures can participate in if yeah. they're honest with one another. Mm -hmm. And those that have it in their very basic mm -hmm. nature, mm -hmm. uh, the desire to harm others, mm -hmm. are ill. Well, they need I, to be treated as ill mm -hmm. and not uh, you know, ignored until they, they commit horrifying crimes. Right. But right. there needs oh, to be yeah. a, a revolution on a number of levels in terms yeah. of medicine and mm -hmm. social service and, and the way that politics works on a, on a community level, mm -hmm. state and gov uh, federal government. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about uh, fascism. We're oh, talking yeah. about in a sense, uh, a true fulfillment of a utopic kind of a communal or a 60s birthed notion of living as a, a human family on this planet, mm -hmm. as individuals who mm -hmm. are able to be both together as one and individual. Yeah, same. yeah, the uh, conundrums that have always been there and considered probably in cro magnon caves they were trying to figure this out, I suppose, some as they sat around a fire and so forth. But I mean, but, but it's now getting to the point where that has to happen. And it's not only, it would seem to me, it's probably not only just the human society. Metaphors are dangerous. Biological metaphors are dangerous. I've been reading Carl Halsoff, who was the organic view, but you've got Lovelock and others uh, who have the idea of Gaia, and you see it in terms of a comprehensive thing, but, uh, but they're dangerous and so forth, but there is a DNA overlay for humanity as a collective whole, but then that has to be also within the context of a larger ecological thing, and that seems to be happening now, well, and sure every the day over showing the us, uh, every week you see another news item on the every way day, the, uh, the every, not is. every week, every day a new revolution comes over the transom of new materials, new capability and all this, mm -hmm. but our systems are out of date with what's required and the poets may be the ones who can help move us in the direction that we have to go if we're going to not only survive mm -hmm. as a species uh, within a larger context, mm -hmm. but also perhaps reach for this transformative metaphoric capability of coming to a new relationship to universe which would be the sure. fulfillment of the full expression of the human capability at the cellular level, individuals at a level that is, uh, you know, so we're at that time of great Absolutely. promise that have been in there, and so the, the poets are painting the way. We wanted you to read your monster poem that okay. you read the other day, but there's no chance because we've run out of time, Stephen. <laughs> we've run out of so time. So you'll have to, uh, you'll have to, to read oh my yeah, work. let me know, let, let them see, you got this thing, Ramapo, 
Ramapo is what? Ramapo 500 Affirmations is my little chapbook of poems. Uh, a lot of uh, poems about motorcycling. And okay. Move fast, move fast. Haiku. Heaven Bone Magazine. Heaven Bone Magazine. You can Bone reach Magazine. me by my email address, yeah, please. Yeah. Feel free to write. Yeah, feel free to write. You've been a pleasure having Stephen Hirsch. A pleasure. Great talking to you. We invite you to tune in. Stay tuned. We'll come back again tomorrow. Steve, thanks a lot. My really pleasure. good talk. We just got started.